Chapter 9 Toxic Myths and the Trail of Chemicals in Our Daily Lives The ubiquity of pollutants in our bodies was recently brought to the attention of Canadian politicians and reported with the comedic heading, Pollutants in Politics, Chemical Testing Reveals Party Leaders' Toxic Relationship. But it was no laughing matter. When leaders of Ontario's three main parties voluntarily gave blood and urine samples to environmentalists to be analyzed for 70 chemical contaminants linked to health problems, all three carried a bewildering variety of pesticides, residues from stain and grease repellents, and compounds used in plastics. In addition to testing positive for high levels of biphenol A, a chemical that mimics the female sex hormone estrogen and is used to make consumer products ranging from plastic baby bottles to the linings of tin cans, the politicians were also tested for polychlorinated biphenyls, chemicals used in electrical transformers that were banned decades ago. Despite no longer being in use, PCBs are so persistent that all the politicians tested positive for them. The highest chemical exposures they had? Phthalates, a class of chemicals used to soften plastic and a primary component of the polyvinyl chloride in cars that gives off that new car smell from the interior. Phthalates are also used as gelling agents and fixatives in cosmetics and grooming products. They are what make the drug capsules soft and baby books for bathtubs squishy. If you recall that tangy taste of water from a hose, that's the phthalates, used to give the plastic in the hose its flexibility. The article was quick to point out the fact that male politicians are exposed more than most men to these toxins because they typically have makeup applied before appearing in television studios. What if the politicians were women who wear makeup every day? Male fetuses exposed to phthalates in the womb may result in malformation of the reproductive tract and decrease semen quality later in life. It would be impossible to cover every toxin and its related effects in this book. Doing justice to just the most common toxins we encounter today would require hundreds of pages. So what we're going to do is look at a handful of toxins that virtually all of us typically meet routinely in our daily lives, but probably don't even know it. They arise from air, water, food, and household products, many of which come from unlikely places. We'll start by looking at an average person's everyday habits, which will reinforce the need to detoxify and further help clarify where these chemicals lurk persistently. A day in the life. Ever wondered if you would pass an FDA inspection? 7 o'clock a.m. Good morning. You wake up in a cozy bed that's made with several ingredients that your body absorbs during the night, including toluene, a chemical linked to birth defects and emitted from the polyurethane foam that makes your bed so comfy, a stain-resistant chemical called perfluorooctanoic acid, fire-retardant chemicals linked to learning disorders and thyroid dysfunction, and antimony, an element linked to heart and lung problems. As of July 1, 2007, all mattresses manufactured or imported into the United States must be treated with these fire-retardant chemicals. After you rise out of bed, you lumber to the bathroom across your synthetic carpet that's also full of chemicals to keep it stainless and less likely to combust in a house fire. 7.05 a.m. Now you're brushing your teeth with toothpaste that comes with a warning label that reads something like this. Keep out of reach of children under six years of age. If more than used for brushing is accidentally swallowed, Get medical help or contact Poison Control Center right away. This label exists because you are exposed to sodium fluoride, linked to enzyme disruption and thyroid problems. 
sodium lauryl sulfate, linked to organ and reproductive toxicity. Triclosan, an antibacterial agent that's registered as a pesticide with the EPA and which is linked to organ toxicity and possibly cancer. If you finished up your dental hygiene with a gargle of mouthwash, which also comes with a warning label, you taste more than its active ingredients. It may contain formaldehyde and ammonia in addition to several flavoring and coloring chemicals, as well as some chemicals that have leached from the plastic in the bottle. 7.15 a.m. Take a shower. Depending on your water source and the use of filters, you could be exposing yourself to chlorine, fluoride, lead, copper, alpha emitters, elements such as radon, uranium, and radium, all of which are linked to cancer, and trihalomethanes, byproducts produced from adding chlorine to disinfect the water. Trihalomethanes are linked to bladder and colorectal cancer, and exposure through drinking and skin absorption has been shown in studies to increase one's chance of miscarriages and other reproductive problems. Haloacetic acids may also be present in your water which are also byproducts of chlorine's disinfection and are classified by the EPA as possible cancer-causing agents. In addition, traces of herbicides and pharmaceutical drugs may also be present. Tap water is not as clean as the government would like us to think. I'll explain how drugs get into your tap water a bit later. Depending on the type of soap and shampoo you use, you expose yourself to coloring agents, dyes, artificial preservatives, and propylene glycol, a lubricant and suspected carcinogen. 7.30 a.m. Apply antiperspirant to keep you dry during your hectic day. Most contain aluminum zirconium, which is toxic to the nervous and reproductive systems. A chemical called BHT which is believed to be a hormonal disruptor and neurotoxin, and various chemicals that give your deodorant stick that distinctive smell. You'll also get another dose of propylene glycol, which helps the deodorant go on so nicely, but is linked to irritation and immune toxicity. Fact. A group of compounds called endocrine disruptors are getting a lot of attention as infertility rates skyrocket and more and more young women complain of having trouble conceiving and giving birth to healthy children. Endocrine disruptors mimic or block hormones that regulate many bodily functions, such as estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, hormones that are key to productive health. Small changes to this intricate system of hormonal signals can translate to major health concerns that could be difficult, if not impossible, to reverse. 7.35 a.m. Time to get dressed. You pull up pants or slip on a dress that just came back from the dry cleaner. Now the garments carry a litany of chemical fumes and residues, including perchloroethylene, also known as perk, tetrachloroethylene, PCE, perclean, and perchlor. This chemical is believed to be capable of causing cancer, especially in the liver and kidneys. It is also shown to affect developing fetuses. If you think you're safe because your clothes are not dry cleaned, are they 100% natural? Or do you have synthetic fibers, think polyester, in your clothing? If so, they may be off-gassing, sometimes called outgassing, which is releasing or giving off a gas or vapor, small molecules of plasticizer fumes, plus flame retardant chemicals. Got mothballs in your closet? Those can deliver an unhealthy dose of the carcinogenic pesticide dichlorobenzene, also found in toilet deodorizers. And if you're getting dressed in the confines of a walk-in closet or a well-insulated bedroom, you are increasing the concentration of these chemical gases emitting from your clothes. Let's not forget other nearby sources of invisible gases, like those from your carpet, rugs, painted walls, and furniture. 
Perk is no perk. In early 2007, California regulators enacted the nation's first statewide ban on the most common chemical used by dry cleaners. By 2023, no more dry cleaning machines that use the toxic solvent perchloroethylene, PERC, will be permitted in the state. California declared PERC a toxic chemical in 1991. State health officials agreed that it can cause lymphoma and cancers in the esophagus, cervix, and bladder. 7.45 a.m. As you apply makeup, foundation, blush, mascara, lipstick, and so on, you are exposed to parabens, which are believed to cause breast cancer and birth abnormalities. Artificial colorants, which are suspected carcinogens toxic to the nervous system, Triethanolamine, which is linked to cancer, allergies, and immune toxicity, and BHA, a chemical that may cause cancer, hormonal imbalances, and be toxic to organs and the immune system. If you apply body lotion, you likely use the kind that contains chemicals to aid in its skin penetration, which can also push toxins from your other cosmetics deeper into your skin. 7.55 a.m. Here comes the hairspray, which probably smells toxic, because it is. Its ingredients can affect your nervous, reproductive, and immune systems. Hair gels, mousses, and cream conditioners are equally toxic. 8 o'clock a.m. Have you had your first cup of coffee yet? Or maybe you prefer the buzz from a diet soda, again loaded with chemicals and artificial sweeteners. While caffeine does afford people some benefits, including a temporary boost of energy, too much can result in a cycle of highs and lows that can ultimately wreak havoc on steady levels of energy-promoting and detoxing hormones. Additionally, caffeine can increase the rate at which you lose nutrients which can aggravate your condition by taking away your body's supply of the very nutrients it needs for proper detoxification. 8.15 a.m. You pour yourself some cereal with milk. It's likely laced with food additives and preservatives, including an artificial sweetener linked to all kinds of health problems, from allergies to behavior problems, brain tumors, neurological diseases, and cancer. As you multitask in the kitchen, you make yourself a sandwich for lunch, again with foods loaded with additives and preservatives, including nitrates, antibiotics, and synthetic hormones. You then wrap it in plastic that contains vinyl chloride, known to cause cancer in the brain, liver, and lungs. You load up the dishwasher and turn it on before you go, but not before you get a good whiff of the chlorine in its first washing stage. Of course, all those cleaning chemicals lying underneath your sink are also emitting unnoticeable fumes into the air you breathe. 8.30 a.m. Don't you love the smell of that new car? On your way to work, you sit in a sea of gases coming from the plastics, fabrics, solvents, and glues in your car. These include polyvinyl chloride, xylene, styrene, and ethyl benzene. If you open your window to let in the fresh air, you inhale the fumes from the cars around you. The off-gassing of chemicals from a new car can take months or years to go away. A 2003 study in Japan found that the chemicals present in a new minivan were more than 35 times the health limit. In four months, they had fallen under the limit, but increased again in the hot summer months taking three years to remain permanently below the limit. All this before nine in the morning. The list continues throughout your day as you work under fluorescent lighting, lunch at a fast food restaurant, and take in all the gases floating around your breathing spaces. A dose of reality. Before you pack up the car and think about living off the land in a remote corner of the country, Let's get one thing straight. We may live in a toxic soup, 
but we can escape it by moving to a far-off location, pretending it's not there, or redefining what normal is. You can't seek safety even in the Arctic Circle. The byproducts and chemicals from our civilizations to the south have landed in this pristine area of the world via air currents. Dust particles grab onto toxic chemicals and travel north to colder climates, which explains why animals and humans who live in the most desolate patches of the globe, thousands of miles from sources of pollution, are showing signs of significant contamination. Inuit women carry toxic levels of PCBs, such that their breast milk would be deemed hazardous by FDA standards. If the above litany of toxins surprises you, let's consider some of the biggest myths out there with regard to toxins. As we saw in Chapter 1, it's impossible to know exactly how many synthetic chemicals exist in the world today. And, according to toxins expert Dr. Doris Rapp, the rules have been written in such a way that we can never know what is safe until people or wildlife begin suffering. A tremendous amount of politicking is involved with the passage of regulatory laws on the one hand and chemical manufacturing on the other. Originally, Congress passed the Toxic Substances Control Act, TSCA, in 1976, as a means of giving the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, a way to track industrial chemicals produced within or imported into the United States, and to be a means for the federal government to require comprehensive health and safety testing for all new and existing chemicals. But now the TSCA is one of the weakest environmental laws in the United States. The Chemical Manufacturers Association has waged a fierce battle against this act, mainly because of the safety testing requirements. Contrary to its original intent, the TSCA rule is exclusive of mandatory health and safety testing on chemicals. Instead, through the TSCA, the EPA can require safety testing only if they can prove that the chemical poses an unreasonable risk of injury to health or the environment. This may not sound so hard to do, but it is, because the same law basically prohibits the EPA from mandating health studies from the Chemical Manufacturers Association. In other words, the only safety testing done is by the chemical manufacturers themselves, which many have said is like having the fox guarding the hen house. In 1990, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, through the initiative of Dr. John Moore, who served as acting administrator of the EPA, initiated a voluntary testing program for high production volume HPV chemicals. To show their cooperation, the Chemical Manufacturers Association agreed to conditional support of the testing program. The conditions and criteria set by the CMA led to long delays upon implementation of the program, including a screening program for chemicals that would identify the ones that may need actual testing. In other words, they again stated that the OECD, like the EPA in the 1976 Act, had to show that a chemical may do harm and need safety testing. To date, the list of OECD high production volume chemicals includes 4,843 substances, with an estimated 7% having had the suggested safety testing. It's naive to assume that all chemicals introduced into our environment or used in marketed products would have at the very least basic safety testing performed before we were exposed to them. Even the EPA states that this is not a prudent assumption. Consider the story of the now infamous DDT as a case in point. DDT is one of the best-known synthetic pesticides of the modern era. This chlorine-based chemical was first synthesized in 1874 
but its insecticidal properties were not discovered until 1939. In the early years of World War II, it combated mosquitoes spreading malaria, typhus, and other insect-borne human diseases among both military and civilian populations. The Swiss chemist Paul Hermann Müller of Geige Pharmaceutical, now Siba Geige, was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology or Medicine in 1948 for his discovery of the high efficiency of DDT as a contact poison against several arthropods. After the war, DDT's production skyrocketed as it made its way into the agricultural world, where it was used as a potent insecticide. But with all the focus on how powerful and effective DDT was on insects, no one focused on its health consequences to not only human life, but other animal life. Sadly, with no safety testing done prior to its widespread use, it affected and harmed millions of unsuspecting humans and wildlife, especially birds. When Rachel Carson's groundbreaking Silent Spring was published in 1962, which cataloged the environmental impacts of the indiscriminate spraying of DDT in the United States and questioned the logic of releasing large amounts of chemicals into the environment without fully understanding their effects on ecology or human health, people began to wonder. Carson suggested that DDT and other pesticides may cause cancer and that their agricultural use was a threat to wildlife. The public outcry that followed eventually led to a ban on DDT for agricultural use. The United States banned it in 1972 for its cancer-causing potential in humans. It also has ties to cardiovascular disease. Today, Scientists partly attribute the comeback of the bald eagle to this ban. It still may persist in the environment, and though it's no longer used in the United States, it is still produced here and exported to other countries, many of which import the DDT-treated food back to us. We may have banned DDT, but there are numerous other pesticides in use today that may pose the same risks. In California alone, where nearly one of every four pounds of pesticides is applied in agriculture, 40 pesticides are listed as known to cause cancer in animals. But pesticide exposure is not confined to agricultural areas. In urban locations, pesticides are used in homes, yards, public buildings, stores, schools, parks, and other settings resulting in per-acre pesticide intensity in some urban areas that exceeds agricultural use. In the United States, a mixture of pesticide residues are detected in the blood and urine of nearly 100% of all persons sampled. For more about pesticides, refer to Appendix A. Myth. Labels tell the whole story. As absurd as this may sound, Companies are not legally required to list all of their ingredients due to trade secrecy laws. In fact, up to 99% of ingredients in any product can be withheld from a label if they are categorized as inert or other, even if they are toxic, pollutants, and hazardous to human health. Some experts have said that the number of hazardous inert chemicals totals more than 650 in pesticide products alone, including commonly used bug sprays and insect repellents that may appear at your next picnic. A total of about 2,500 substances is added to products without you having a clue as to what those substances are or how they could potentially harm you and your family. Vinyl chloride was once considered an inert ingredient found in aerosol products such as hairspray and deodorant. If you were to flash back to the early 1970s and get a whiff of the air in hair salons, you'd be inhaling this insidious chemical. When a wave of cancers surfaced in the people who worked in the chemical plants making vinyl chloride, manufacturers rethought this dangerous ingredient and stopped using it for hairspray. 
Most of today's nail salons smell toxic due to the high concentration of volatile organic compounds, VOCs, filling the air from all those nail care products. The nail industry is not regulated, but the EPA is encouraging salons to convert their toxic products to eco- and people-friendly ones as increasing studies about the effects of long-term exposure to VOCs in nail care products emerge. California is the first state to pass a law that requires cosmetics companies to list all ingredients that can cause cancer and reproductive harm, even if they are deemed inert. Hopefully, other states will follow. Fact. When Time magazine featured the worst jobs in America in 2007, topping the list were industrial laundry and dry cleaning workers because they deal with biohazardous materials and toxic waste on a daily basis. Nail salon workers took the number three spot, also due to their constant exposure to noxious products. Most people assume that you need to have been exposed to a large dose of toxins in order for any health implications to occur. This is simply not true. Chronic, long-term exposure to even the smallest amount of certain toxins can be harmful to your health. For example, the solvent benzene, which increases the risk of leukemia, even at small amounts of exposure, is part of our everyday lives. We are regularly exposed to benzene while breathing tobacco smoke, even second-hand smoke, pumping gasoline while driving in high-traffic areas, and from industrial air pollution. Higher levels are released from the vapors of benzene-containing products, such as glues, paints, furniture wax, and detergents. An estimated 44,240 new cases of leukemia will be diagnosed in the United States in 2007. Sometimes, chronic low doses can be even more toxic than acute high doses, this looks to be especially true when it comes to the toxins that affect your hormonal or endocrine system. Moreover, toxic chemicals can react in unexpected ways, especially when combined with other chemicals. Scientists simply cannot predict who is vulnerable to which substances or at which dosages. No one can tell you, for instance, that your body can tolerate chemical A but not chemical B, or that your body can handle X amount of a certain chemical but no more. The factors that trigger illness or disease in any given person are vague and unknown. Whether you are exposed to a few toxic substances or a broad range of synthetics, there's no way to tell when and if your exposure will lead to disease. Myth. Toxins are harmless in small amounts. So-called synergies also are created in the environment and body that can exacerbate the effect of any single chemical. A synergy is simply a combination of two things that, together, equal more than the sum of the individual parts. In straightforward mathematics, 1 plus 1 equals 2. No synergy here. But in the chemical world, 1 plus 1 can equal a lot more than two due to the interactive synergistic effect chemicals can have on one another. For example, on a scale of one to ten, toxin A may be considered a two, low, while toxin B is a three. But together in the body, they may cause a powerful level, nine, high effect. Synergies bring the number of potential chemical permutations to a nearly infinite amount. As Randall Fitzgerald notes in his book, The Hundred-Year Lie, How Food and Medicine Are Destroying Your Health, 2006, what distresses and perplexes me is the realization that even if the government had the resources to thoroughly conduct widespread safety testing, which it doesn't, our technology is too primitive to detect all of the synthetic chemicals in combination or to complete the task within our own lifetimes or even within the lifespans of any of our grandchildren. 
Fitzgerald goes on to share what Sheldon Krimsky calculated for his 2000 book, Hormonal Chaos, The Scientific and Social Origins of the Environmental Endocrine Hypothesis. If you take the most common 1,000 chemicals and test them in unique combinations of three at a single dose per experiment, it would take 166 million different experiments to cover all the possibilities. And with up to 100,000 different synthetic chemicals in production and in the marketplace, the potential number of synergistic combinations becomes outrageous. Krimsky writes that it could take more than a thousand years to complete a full testing program, an effort that would involve a level of complexity that could easily overwhelm our most advanced testing systems and surely our federal budget. More than 3,000 man-made chemicals get added to food products in the United States for a variety of reasons. Texture, taste, color, appearance, odor, flavor, or just to get you addicted, as you'll see later on. Few of these chemicals have been tested in combination to investigate their potential synergistic effects in the body that can potentially be toxic to you. When Baker James Dewar invented the Twinkie in 1930, he used real ingredients, flour, sugar, salt, baking soda, eggs, and cream. Today's Twinkie has morphed into a scientific experiment. While Twinkies still do contain traces of the original ingredients, they also hold 37 other ingredients that you won't find in your pantry. The creamy white filling is made mostly from partially hydrogenated vegetable oil and or beef fat. Polysorbate 60 is added to it which is a gooey substance derived from corn, palm oil, and petroleum that helps replace cream and eggs at a fraction of the cost. Cellulose gum gives the filling a smooth, slippery feel. To get that vanilla flavor, they create it artificially in petrochemical plants. The cake part contains the emulsifier lecithin, a chemical that mimics the taste of butter. The real stuff would go rancid on a store shelf. And artificial dyes that give the cake the golden look of eggs. Sorbic acid, the only actual preservative in Twinkies, comes from petroleum. The Inhalations of Modern Life The World Health Organization estimates that 4.6 million people die each year from causes directly attributable to air pollution, both indoor and outdoor. Worldwide, more deaths per year are linked to air pollution than to automobile accidents. Health effects range from subtle biochemical and physiological changes to difficulty breathing, aggravation of existing respiratory and cardiac conditions, birth defects, damage to the immune neurological or reproductive system, and cancer. In 2007, UCLA researchers published a stunning report that said exposure to a combination of diesel exhaust and high blood cholesterol increases the risk for heart attack and stroke far more than exposure to either factor alone. This is a perfect example of how toxins can have a deadly synergistic effect, even with tissues or cells that are not themselves toxins. Adding diesel particles, one, to cholesterol fats, one, equals three, not two. Cholesterol by itself is not a toxin, but this combination creates a dangerous interaction that wreaks cardiovascular havoc far beyond what is caused by either the diesel or cholesterol separately. It is now known that cholesterol is a marker of underlying inflammation. Roughly 120 million Americans live in areas where the outdoor air is unhealthy. Air pollution comes from many different sources, such as factories, power plants, dry cleaners, cars, buses, trucks, and even wind-blown dust and wildfires. 
It can threaten the health of human beings, trees, lakes, crops, and animals, as well as damage the ozone layer and buildings. It can also cause haze, reducing visibility in national parks and wilderness areas. The substances that make up air pollution include gases such as sulfur dioxides, nitrogen oxides, hydrocarbons, and carbon monoxide. Particulate matter such as smoke, dust, fumes, and aerosols. Pesticides, chemicals, toxic elements, radioactive materials, and several other substances. These are considered primarily air pollutants, meaning they are generated directly from a source or process. Then there are also secondary air pollutants formed in the air when primary pollutants react or interact. Ground-level ozone, which makes up photochemical smog, is a classic example of this. Some pollutants can be both primary and secondary. That is, they are both emitted directly and formed from other primary pollutants. Of the 188 known air toxins, the top 33 that the EPA considers the greatest threat to human health are ever-present. The 33 most hazardous air toxins. Acetaldehyde. Acrogens. Acrylonitrile. Arsenic compounds. Benzene. Beryllium compounds. 1,3-butadiene. Cadmium compounds carbon tetrachloride, chloroform, chromium compounds, coke oven emissions, 1,3-dichloropropane, diesel particulate matter, ethylene dibromide, ethylene dichloride, ethylene oxide, formaldehyde, hexachlorobenzene, hydrazine, lead compounds, manganese compounds, mercury compounds, methylene chloride, nickel compounds, perchloroethylene, polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs, polycyclic organic matter, POM, propylene dichloride, quinoline, 1,1,2,2-tetrachloroethane, trichloroethylene, vinyl chloride. Classic car fumes. Let's take a pollutant that is getting more and more difficult to avoid. Diesel particulate matter. Particulates are tiny particles of solid or liquid suspended in a gas, which is partly what comprises diesel exhaust. In addition, these soot particles also carry carcinogenic components such as benzopyrenes, aerosols such as ash particulates, metallic abrasion particles, sulfates, and silicates. All of these bode badly for the body. Exposure to diesel exhaust and its particulates is a known occupational hazard to truckers, railroad workers, and anyone using diesel-powered equipment. If we don't lighten up our commutes or take diesel-powered engines off the road, everyone can consider this a hazard. How many of us have sat behind a truck or school bus and tried to hold our breath as we roll through the black cloud it leaves behind? There is perhaps no more common experience in America than the daily drives we take, whether it's to and from work or shuffling kids around. Today, our daily commutes are breaking records. We average 25 minutes on the road per trip, and millions of us, at last count, there were 3.4 million in 2000, are extreme commuters, traveling at least 90 minutes each way to get to work. And certainly there are millions more who are somewhere in between especially people who live in suburbs of sprawling metropolises like Houston, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, New York, and Chicago. That's a lot of time driving in dirty air. Nowadays, we are more likely to drive cars that don't require diesel gas, 
But diesel-burning engines are still around us, filling the air we breathe, from trucks and buses to roadside machinery and equipment that run on diesel gas, not to mention nearby factories and power plants. Clean air initiatives hope to reduce the number of diesel-burning engines on the road in the future. But we may still feel their effects for years to come, after they have been taken off the road. Because diesel particulates are so small, they can easily penetrate deep into the lungs once inhaled. The rough surfaces of these particles makes it easy for them to bind with other toxins in the environment, thus increasing the hazards of particle inhalation. The EPA estimates that a proposed set of changes in diesel engine technology could result in 12,000 fewer premature mortalities, 15,000 fewer heart attacks, 6,000 fewer emergency room visits by children with asthma, and 8,900 fewer respiratory-related hospital admissions each year in the United States. Not surprisingly, Los Angeles topped the American Lung Association's Bad Air 2007 list of most polluted cities in America. But there are signs of improvement. The number of days residents breathed the nation's worst ozone levels was fewer than in previous years. According to the EPA, the levels of six pollutants, including ozone and particulate matter, have declined 54% since 1970 in the city, when the Clean Air Act became law. Even as the national level of ozone, a key component of smog, declined, 99 million people in the United States still lived in counties with failing grades for ozone. The thrill of a new car. Now that you have closed your car windows, let me ask you, have you ever wondered what makes a new car smell so new? Most of us have experienced the euphoria that comes with buying and getting into a brand new car fresh off the assembly line. The air inside new cars may contain some of the highest levels of vinyl chloride, which is used in the manufacture of automobile interiors. At room temperature, Vinyl chloride releases dioxins in the air to produce that characteristic new car smell. Vinyl chloride, which is thought to be the most troubling kind of plastic from a health perspective, is also found in the discharge of exhaust gases from factories that manufacture or process vinyl chloride or evaporation from areas where chemical wastes are stored. Most of the vinyl chloride produced in the United States is used to make polyvinyl chloride, or what we know as PVC. Acute exposure in humans to vinyl chloride via inhalation has resulted in effects on the central nervous system, such as dizziness, drowsiness, headaches, and, yes, that giddy feeling, which is more or less a high. Long-term effects can include liver damage and a set of symptoms that is actually termed vinyl chloride disease, which include joint and muscle pain, changes in the bones of your fingers, and thickening of the skin. Those sound like pretty common symptoms of people diagnosed with arthritis and scleroderma. This points to the fact that it's not just outdoor air quality we need to worry about. Indoor air quality can be just as harmful, if not more so. In fact, the average indoor environment is actually more polluted as it contains hazardous chemicals in concentrations 10 to 40 times greater than those outside. Indoor pollution typically comes from formaldehyde, aerosol spray products, air fresheners, asbestos, microbes and mold spores, carbon dioxide, house dust, cooking gas, colognes, and cleaning products. In a poorly ventilated building, these pollutants are concentrated and can give rise to a number of symptoms. Airborne chemicals can also come from lead-based paints, indoor pesticides, for example, roach and ant killers, building materials and furnishings, 
chemically treated carpets, cabinetry or furniture made of certain pressed wood products, central heating and cooling systems, plasticizers, and tobacco smoke. Asthma afflicts about 20 million Americans, including 6.3 million children. In 2000, there were nearly 2 million emergency room visits and nearly half a million hospitalizations due to asthma, at a cost of almost $2 billion, and causing 14 million missed school days each year. Studies confirm that indoor environmental factors contribute to the incidence of asthma. According to a World Health Report in 2002, indoor air pollution is responsible for 2.7% of the global burden of disease. Formaldehyde's Hiding Places We saw earlier how beds now contain a wide range of synthetics that give off gases for our bodies to absorb throughout the night. One of these gases is formaldehyde, which makes the EPA's top 33 list of most hazardous air toxins. It's used as a flame retardant in your mattress, along with brominated substances that essentially build up in your body over time. Formaldehyde gas can cause several health problems, such as headaches, dizziness, nasal congestion, sore throat, scratchy eyes, coughing, and immune system abnormalities. Most fabrics treated with this flame retardant continuously emit this toxic gas to the tune of 500 parts per million at the fabric's surface and breathing just 0.1 parts per million for an extended time period can have health consequences. This is something to think about given that children's sleepwear is required by federal law to meet flammability standards. Formaldehyde isn't confined to just your mattress. It's found in several household products, including disinfectants, bleach, aerosols, air fresheners, window and carpet cleaners, dry cleaning fluids, and pesticides. The most significant source of formaldehyde in the indoor environment is probably pressed wood products, particle boards, plywood, and fiberboard. It's been argued that the increase in childhood asthma in industrialized nations, tripling in just the last 30 years, could be attributed to the rise in formaldehyde's presence. What's more, children whose mothers use products in the home made of chemicals and that emit formaldehyde are more likely to develop asthma after birth. Once again, Proof that babies in the womb are not as protected as we previously thought. Many textile products have formaldehyde finishes. These include nylon and all polyester blends with permanent press fabrics. Synthetic carpets also contain formaldehyde, along with more than a dozen other hazardous chemicals, including xylene, benzene, and toluene chemicals that continue to outgas from the carpets for up to five years after installation. The most dangerous stage of off-gassing is from four weeks to three months following installation. While carpets over five years old usually have stopped off-gassing, they may then become breeding grounds for dust mites and mold. Mold is a biological contaminant rather than a chemical one, but it can give rise to damaging fungal toxins. The Waste in Water Water is essential to life, the life of the planet's ecosystems as well as to the human body. The pollution and toxicity of our oceans, lakes, waterways, groundwater, and drinking water is having a devastating impact on our health and the health of our planet and wildlife. And you don't have to live near a beach that is closed down due to a toxic spill to be aware of the dangers or experience the effects of contaminated water. Water supplies must originate from somewhere. But those sources are becoming infected with pollutants from a variety of places. Power plants, factories, septic systems, sewage spills, waste disposal sites for hazardous materials that sink into the groundwater, animal feedlots, landfills, 
acid water runoff from mines, disposal wells, land disposal of sludge, spray irrigation, buried storage tanks and pipelines, and even from us dumping things down the drain like cosmetics and unused drugs. This list goes on and on. All these water contaminants in turn affect the food we eat because they become part of the soil and water supplies that ultimately nourish and grow our food. Aquatic wildlife has taken a beating in the last several decades, and advances in technology are now giving us an unprecedented look at chemical contaminants in bodies of water throughout the United States and abroad. Among the most disturbing evidence of water pollution are the reports of sexually deformed and chemically castrated fish and amphibians. In several lakes and waterways, including the Great Lakes, Chesapeake Bay, the Columbia River in Washington, and the Potomac, fish have mutated into hermaphrodites, having both male and female sex organs, or changed sex entirely, gone from males to females. In Southern California, Many bottom-dwelling fish off the coast are now hermaphrodites. What's more, the ocean floor's sediment is contaminated with estrogenic chemicals that get absorbed by bottom-feeding organisms and passed up along the food chain. Chemicals that mimic the female hormone estrogen come from herbicides, fungicides, and pesticides that find their way to bodies of water. These then get incorporated into the biosystem that eventually becomes our water and food supplies. If these chemicals cause serious reproductive abnormalities and potential extinction in wildlife, what can they do to us? In 2002, the first nationwide study of man-made chemicals and hormones in 139 streams revealed that 80% of streams tested were contaminated. Several of the chemicals examined are known or suspected of disrupting the hormone systems of animals and people. Of these, only a small fraction have been regulated at all, much less tested for toxicity, persistence in the environment, or other harmful characteristics, such as hormone disruption, some of the same unregulated, widely used hormone-disrupting chemicals have been detected at trace levels in the San Francisco Bay. In 2005, the United States Geological Survey found that byproducts of common chemical products used by humans, including antibacterial soap, steroids, bug sprays, and prescription drugs, were entering streams and groundwater causing a disruption to fish reproduction while increasing people's resistance to antibiotics when they consumed the fish. As you can imagine, damage to the reproductive health of vulnerable fish populations may result in detrimental consequences to local fisheries and aquatic ecosystems. In addition, there is concern that people could become further exposed to hormone-disrupting chemicals by eating contaminated fish. So it's not just mercury that we need to concern ourselves with when it comes to seafood. It's important to understand that hormones aren't just about those related to sex like estrogen and progesterone. A vast array of hormones control much of our bodily systems, from conception to death. They essentially set our metabolic processes in motion and have as much to say about our reproductive system and menstrual cycle for women, as they do about our hunger, ability to gain and lose weight, maintain a healthy immune system, keep a beating heart, recover from injury, think clearly, sleep soundly, have a general sense of well-being, and so much more. If you disrupt your body's natural hormonal state, you throw your entire body out of whack and leave it vulnerable to an onslaught of health problems, from minor to life-threatening. When drinking water is dangerous A minimal amount of drinking water contamination is to be expected as a result of natural processes. However, today's tap water, 
whether coming from municipal water supplies or private wells, from surface water or underground aquifers, is much more than minimally contaminated. Contaminants in drinking water may be either chemical or microbial. Microbial contaminants, such as viruses, bacteria, and parasites, come from human and animal waste. An outbreak of the microscopic parasite Cryptosporidium in the Milwaukee water supply in 1993 killed 400 people and sickened some 400,000. But chemicals are the most likely hazard, and more than 700 chemicals have been identified in American drinking water. These include asbestos, pesticides, heavy metals, industrial waste, nitrates, and a variety of chemicals, including byproducts created from the use of disinfecting agents and those known to be carcinogenic. The EPA only monitors 84 out of the 2,100 contaminants found in drinking water, and a significant number of violations of the standards set for these 84 contaminants have been reported since the Safe Drinking Water Act was first enacted in 1974. One of the most surprising discoveries of late has been the detection of perchlorate in 160 public water systems in 22 states, which urged the Environmental Working Group to publish a press release in 2006 declaring perchlorate a widespread public health threat for pregnant women. The vast majority of perchlorate manufactured in the United States is used by the Department of Defense to make solid rocket and missile fuel, while smaller amounts are used to make fireworks and road flares. Perchlorate is also a contaminant of certain types of fertilizer that were widely used in the early part of the 20th century, but are in limited use today. In addition to water supplies, perchlorate has also been found in a wide variety of domestic and imported produce. Tests by the CDC and independent researchers have confirmed that virtually all Americans carry some level of perchlorate in their bodies, and that many have levels well above the levels found to lower thyroid levels. What's in your water? Pollution, old pipes, and outdated treatment can render tap water harmful even though you can't see, taste, or smell the contaminants. Up to 7 million Americans become sick from dirty tap water each year. Bottled water fares no better. About one-fourth of bottled water is bottled tap water, and by some accounts, as much as 40% is derived from tap water. Popular brands of bottled water have tested positive for elevated levels of arsenic, bacteria, and other impurities. According to the Natural Resources Defense Council, www.nrdc.org, one brand of spring water, whose label pictured a lake and mountains, actually came from a well in an industrial facility's parking lot near a hazardous waste dump. It was periodically contaminated with industrial chemicals at levels above FDA standards. Mind you, the bottled water industry is largely unregulated in the United States. Simple solution? Filter your tap water. Bottled water companies have made a killing in the last decade as people turn to them for convenience, purity, or even fashion. The surprise? Most bottled water is still just tap water. But unlike tap water, bottled water is not regulated. And, to make matters worse, the plastic bottles it comes in often leach chemicals into the water. The bottles are often made of PVC, polyvinyl chloride, an environmental hazard itself. A four-year study conducted by the nonprofit Natural Resources Defense Council found contaminants in one-third of bottled water samples to exceed EPA tap water standards. Other independent studies have discovered fluoride, phthalates, trihalomethanes, and arsenic in bottled water. 
coming either from the bottling process or from the bottles themselves. Environmental groups are also concerned about the amount of waste that these plastic bottles create. While one might assume that really bad water would be self-evident by way of its smell or taste, sadly, the most devastating stories of unexplained illness and disease in pockets of communities across the country often don't become front-page material until enough bodies have been collected and curiosity has mounted. In 2000, the hit movie Erin Brockovich was based on one woman's crusade to prove that a chemical leak into the groundwater of a small town led to a disturbing array of health problems in the community. Another case that made headlines recently involved a military base at Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, where 75,000 Marines and their families were exposed to toxic tap water that may have caused cancer and birth defects. Federal hearings took place in the summer of 2007, and numerous residents of the base testified about their personal horror stories. Children born with severe disabilities or disorders, and many who later died of unusual cancers. Are chlorine and fluoride a problem? Two of the most damaging substances, both to overall health and to digestive function, found abundantly in the water supply are chlorine and fluoride. This identification of fluoride as a pollutant may come as a shock to some, for we have been led to believe that it is an essential nutrient needed to prevent tooth decay, not a water pollutant. The fact of the matter is that the EPA has set a maximum contaminant level, an enforceable standard set for drinking water contaminants, for fluoride, substantiating that it is indeed a contaminant. To make matters worse, the form of fluoride used in water fluoridation programs is an industrial waste product. More than 90% of the fluoridated U.S. municipal water supplies use hydrofluorosilic acid, or its sodium salt, as a fluoridating agent. These chemicals are highly toxic byproducts of phosphate fertilizer production. Their presence in our drinking water supplies is more about the corporate bottom line than about the claimed benefit of preventing tooth decay. The appalling aspect of this whole scenario is the adverse health effects that can result from fluoride exposure, even at the relatively low doses used in water fluoridation programs. These may include hyperactivity, learning disabilities, cancer, hypothyroidism, dental fluorosis, permanent discoloration of teeth in children, arthritis, kidney disease, gastrointestinal disorders, birth defects, lowered immunity. Links to studies verifying the role of fluoride in these disorders and others may be found at http colon backslash backslash www dot s l w e b dot org backslash bibliography dot h t m l a website founded by Fluoride Action Network, a group formed in two thousand by scientists, including EPA scientists dentists, and environmentalists to educate the public on the toxicity of fluoride compounds and the health impacts of current fluoride exposures. Chlorine, added as a disinfectant to water, becomes a problem when it unites with other pollutants and or organic matter, such as decaying vegetation, to form trihalomethanes, THMs. These compounds include such deadly chemicals as chloroform, bromoform, and carbon tetrachloride, all of which have been linked with increased incidences of atherosclerosis, colon and rectal cancer, and bladder cancer. Chlorinated water also destroys much of our beneficial intestinal flora, needed to protect us from pathogens. Drugged Drinking Water Pharmaceutical drugs prescribed at high rates, such as antidepressants and antibiotics, 
are now turning up in rivers and groundwater. In addition to people dumping excess or expired prescription drugs down the drain or toilet, pharmaceuticals are also making their way into drinking water through human waste after people take these drugs. They enter sewage treatment centers, which don't weed out these chemicals before drinking water is processed. This phenomenon is not limited to the United States. England got its first dose of this reality a few years ago when scientists looked at 12 pharmaceuticals thought to pose an environmental threat, including painkillers, antibiotics, and antidepressants, and found traces of these pharmaceuticals in both sewage waters and drinking waters. They also found traces in the rivers downstream from sewage treatment plants. No doubt this could be one of the reasons why ocean life is continuing to decline around the world. And it seems as if it won't be very long at all before these prescription drug pollutants start showing up in shellfish, such as shrimp, crab, and lobsters, and maybe even in seaweed someday. Pharmaceutical chemicals are not regulated by the Environmental Protection Agency, so there is no enforced limit of pharmaceuticals in the drinking water. In fact, in the United States, there is no government agency that is even testing the level of pharmaceuticals in public drinking water on a regular basis. So it is possible, in fact likely, that these levels will continue to rise in the years ahead without being detected or reported to the public at all. I often think about the environmental impact of our culture's massive consumption levels of prescription drugs. Currently, this is an underacknowledged area of study that will surely take on a more prominent place in research and public health circles. I don't want to imagine a day when the fish market is selling Prozac-free perch. Formulaic food. If there's one thing humans have perfected in the last century, it's how to process food and create flavors and additives exclusively from chemicals that make many common foods taste the way they do. In fact, food production outpaced population growth over the last 40 years, and about 90% of the money that Americans spend on food is used to buy processed food. Whether you live in a sprawling metropolis or a small town in the middle of America, you probably don't have to go too far to find a fast food restaurant, or at least a convenience store that sells mostly processed foods. We have also entered an era of genetically modified foods, which are just that, genetically mutated foods that are not necessarily better for you. The health implications not only to humans, but also to the environment, is a hotly contested debate. The introduction of genetically altered food could have serious consequences, such as allergic reactions and increased resistance to certain antibiotics. Two of the prime targets for genetic engineering, soy and corn, are America's cash crops. These are among the accomplices in our largely overprocessed food supply entering our diets as ingredients in processed foods. The infiltration of fast food into our lives and its economic, cultural, and health consequences was expertly described in chilling detail in Eric Schlosser's best-selling book, Fast Food Nation, The Dark Side of the All-American Meal. Schlosser gives an incisive history of the development of American fast food drawing alarming conclusions about how we have come to face epidemic obesity and toxic, sometimes lethal, food sources, and generally how the fast food industry has changed the landscape of how Americans eat and live. On any given day, one out of four Americans opts for a quick and inexpensive meal at a fast food restaurant, without giving either its speed or its thriftiness a second thought. According to Time magazine, 70% of kids age 6 to 8 think fast food is healthier than home food. 
Fast food spending by consumers has increased 18-fold since 1970. A typical hamburger in 1957 weighed one ounce and contained 210 calories. Today, that same hamburger is six ounces and packs 618 calories. What's worse, 25% of the vegetables eaten in the United States are French fries. Despite the choices you have every day over what you eat and what you do, the mere convenience and reliability of fast foods and even processed foods found at local markets has programmed many Americans in a way that makes eating this food a mindless act. That is, people eat these foods without thinking about what they are doing and how it will affect them in the long run. The last time you ordered from a fast food giant or bought a grab-and-go lunchbox from a corner store, did you think about where the food came from or how it was made? Probably not. You unwrapped your food and dug right in. Among the chilling details uncovered by Slosser are the current methods for preparing fast food and, for that matter, processed foods in general, which are less likely to be found in cookbooks than in trade journals such as Food Technologist and Food Engineering. The scientists behind the development of the industry for fast and processed food, which took off after World War II, knew less about nutrition than they did about making products taste better, last longer, and be safe from contamination by microorganisms. The industry made calories affordable and available at the expense of our health, and at the expense of natural foods' nutritive components. All that technology behind taste, shelf life, and, ironically, safety, means processing and altering natural foods to the point that they contain few nutrients and many preservatives, chemicals, sodium, and so on. Think about the evolution of the Twinkie. This is the end of the CD. The audiobook continues on the next CD.